Good evening, everybody. Thank you for turning out. I am deeply, deeply encouraged by you all being out here this evening because of this moment in time for our nation, not just South Haven, not just Michigan, but for our nation. It was suggested to me that before I actually get into the text of what I'm saying, that perhaps maybe a little bit of explanation about the title. Because you can take that the wrong way and it means that it's a criticism. From the time that when I grew up in the late 1960s, early 1970s, as a child of the 1970s, I remember growing up on the East Coast in Maryland that we had elements of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Civil Rights Movement, the Black Panthers, all of it. It seemed like there was always something frothing in the foam. And there was a general recognition that we had the power to change things that people were involved. High school students, the busing crisis in Prince George's, Maryland, where I rode up, where I, where, I, where I grew up, everybody seemed to be doing something. Parents, kids, everybody. And there were some tremendous things that happened as a result of the civil rights movement, obviously. Some victories, some progress, and we enjoyed that progress. But in the process of enjoying that progress, I think we lost our edge. Because if there's one thing that American history has proven time and time and again is that the bigots, the racists, the dividers, they don't go away. They play musical chairs. They, take, they change form. They change their faces. They change their tactics. But they're always there. So when I started thinking about this, and as people came to me over many years saying, we're asleep. I got this from members in church. I got this from students. I got this from relatives. I got this from friends. So this basically is a distillation of what people have been telling me. And I'd like to share that with you. And I'm going to do that in a way that I don't normally do. In fact, I prefer not to do it the way I'm going to do it right now for reasons that will become, I hope, obvious to you. Because it is not to draw attention to oneself, but to basically make a statement which is consistent with the moment that we're in nationally, this atmosphere, this condition, the threats that we're up under. So. It happened one night in PG County. One night in PG County, Prince George's County, Maryland, where I grew up. On a, particular, on a particular summer night in 1974, this being the state of Maryland, and PG County being right outside of the DC area, right over here, Laurel, Burtonville, Greenbelt, a lot of activity around there. And that is Prince George's County, one of, the heavy, one of the most heavily populated counties with African Americans then and now. Even more so now because I just found out about a week ago that Washington, D.C., we, we used to call it Chocolate City because there were so many black people there. Well, Washington, D.C. is no longer a majority black city. Things have been going on, demographic changes like any other community around our country. And so many people that have been getting pushed out of Washington, D.C. have been getting pushed out into Prince George's County because of gentrification and a whole range of other issues. But at the time when I was growing up, Prince George's County was predominantly black county with a predominantly white police force. And they were bigots. They beat people up, they shot people, and they enjoyed their jobs. And Yes, that's me. <laughs> it took me three years to grow that thing. <laughs> and it took a Marine Corps barber 27 seconds to get rid of it. <laughs> but in 1974, I was working at Landover Mall in, in Prince George's County. And this is a picture of Landover Mall. You know, malls have had their day. They've come and gone. At the time, it was one of the biggest malls on the East Coast. I think it was, the, the, if not the first, one of the first, it certainly was the biggest mall at the time when it opened up. And you know, we did what high school kids did. We went to the mall and hung out. And I had a job at Landover Mall working in a donut shop as a janitor. I came from a home where my, my, mom was, my mother was single. My father walked out when I was 11. She had five kids. 
And so we all had to chip in to make the economic thing work. Okay? Not unique. A lot of families have done that of whatever stride, whatever background. So we just did what we had to do. But in 1974, you need to remember this. In 1974, that was only six years after the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King had been assassinated. We were still hearing the echoes of a king. We still were hearing the last speech that he made on April 3rd when he basically prophesied his own assassination. We still were remembering what he wrote from a letter in a Birmingham jail. We still remember what happened on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. We remembered him getting bricked and bottled in Chicago. We still remembered all that stuff. In 1974, that was still fresh information. So we were still caught up in all that, trying to figure out what do we do in the absence of a king. And we also recall that in 1968, that he had gone to Memphis to assist in a sanitation worker's strike. As I tell my students all the time, it's, we should take note of the fact that when he went to Memphis to, to help with the sanitation workers' strike, that before people were talking about their wages, which of course they were concerned with, and their work conditions, which of course they were concerned with, and their work hours, which of course they were concerned with, black men who generally had to do the hard, heavy lifting on the sanitation truck while white men drove the truck. Black men had to go in people's backyards and deal with dogs and and, and all, all kind of refuse that they, they, the, the movement for recycling wasn't like it is today where people put things in separate containers. So it was extremely difficult, disgusting work. Both all that confronting them, they protested with this sign, I am a man. Because the logic was this. Before we talk about my wages, my hours, and my work conditions, if you can't come to grips with the fact that I'm a human being and I'm a man, if you deny that, if you can't wrap your mind around that, if you can't accept that, what's the point of talking about my wages, my work, or my conditions? You can't even accept my common humanity. So can we at least first agree that I am a man? And if we do agree upon that, then we can talk about my work, my wages, and my conditions. So he went there. And like many protests of that period, the National Guard again called out, I am a man. He made that speech, went back to the Lorraine Hotel, and on April 4, 1968, he was shot down. The advocate of nonviolence was, ironically enough, taken out of this world by violence. What could be more paradoxical, paradoxically American? I remember at the time, my relatives, my aunts, my uncles, my mother, people hysterical, crying. The world had ended. What were, what were we going to do now? What now, we were asking. In 1974, we still asking that question, what now? The grief was palpable. It was widespread. There was dislocation. But in the meantime, in the meantime, by 1974, people had to get on with life, right? My dream was to go to the United States Air Force Academy. My dream was to become a fighter pilot. My dream was so specific, I knew even what kind of aircraft I wanted to fly. I wanted to fly an F-105 Thunder Chief. They said that this plane was difficult to fly. They said that if you weren't a good pilot, only the best pilots could fly this plane. So of course, I would be that guy. <laughs> but first things first, before, before Air Force Academy, before fighter pilot school, before F-105 Thunder Chief, before you do any of that, I had to get out of high school. So I was attending Duval Senior High School, and before I could get out of high school, I had to finish mopping those floors at my job. <laughs> But on this particular night that just happened in PG County, there was going to be a gathering of people in the town of Glen Arden for a gathering called the Battle of the Bands concert. The town fathers of Glen Arden, the town city council, had said, you know what? You all have done so good for the graduating seniors from du Duval Senior High School. You all have done so good. We want to do something to celebrate, our, to celebrate our youth. So they had invited four bands to come and just basically battle each other out. It's going to be a block party.
So when I got off work about 9.30 that night, 9.30, 10 o'clock that night, I got on my brand new 10-speed bike that my mother had bought me and rode on down to the Glen Arden Municipal Town Hall. They call this is the, municip the municipal center. They call it the town hall. And I sat off from the rest of the crowd. So I could just, I could just enjoy the music and enjoy the moment. And then the Prince George County cop showed up. I saw a Maryland National Park police car go by. I also saw a Maryland State Trooper go by. Now, if you live in a black community, if you live in PG County, when you see police cars go by, you understand, generally speaking, sometimes if somebody's breaking into your house or there's a crime going on, you just assume not call the cops because it gets worse when they show up. And understand, let me tell you, I'm a fan of the police. They have a hard job to do. But in 1974, these guys are different. So I saw a park police car go by, a state police car go by, that caught my attention. But then two PG County Costco cars went by, those guys always traveled in pairs. And when they showed up, that's when I got nervous. The next thing that happened, I got up, I got up grabbed my bike, and started walking across the town hall, and then the storm hit. I ran into a wave of people who were moving extremely fast. I didn't know why they were moving that way, but they seemed to be very nervous. And then, I turned to go another way, ran into another group of people, looked like they were being herded. And then I looked and I saw police in riot gear, dogs, tear gas. And then at some point, all hell just broke loose. People were running everywhere. I remember thinking to myself, this reminds me of some of those scenes I've seen from Birmingham. My father was from Montgomery, Alabama. My mother lived in Montgomery, Alabama. She's from Chicago, but she moved to Montgomery when she was a young girl. So what they told me about life down there reminded me of all that. I saw them dragging this girl by her hair across the ground, and every now and then they stop and take the baton and beat her up. I was doing my best to get away from there. I got on my 10-speed bike and got one leg over the middle crossbar, and that's when four of them hit me. And they proceeded to beat me with those billy clubs. And I could hear the fuzz on my bones. And there's a strange thing that happens to you when someone's trying to take your life. I remember looking off to the side, and there was even a cop jumping up and down on my brand new 10-speed bike. I remember thinking to myself, what's up with the bike? They used the N-word, peppered with jigaboo, coon, all the other epithets. And then for whatever reason, they went on to find someone else. I remember lying there in the mud with blood and snot coming out of different parts of my body, trying to figure out what had just happened, why had it just happened. I didn't know it. But at that moment, a seed of rage had been planted in me that would last for several decades, quite honestly. And I spent the next several decades praying to God, asking why. I was just a 14-year-old kid coming home from a job at the mall as a janitor who wanted to stop by for a few moments and enjoy the Battle of the Bands concert. And was nearly killed that night. But let me be very clear here. Bad things happen to bad people all the time, right? Right? This is just my bad thing. So people get victimized all the time. But the one thing that I never gave anybody permission to do was make me a victim. If I want to be a victim, I'll let you know when. I haven't given permission yet. So victimization occurs. But to be a victim requires a choice. I never made that choice. What I did was to become an investigator. The tool was history. To find out what is it that's going on in America that makes people do this kind of stuff. I have yet to find the answer. 
but it has led to the acquisition of some very interesting, interesting information. <coughs> that night, when I got home, my sister saw me at, I knew if my mother saw me, she was just gonna freak out. So I knocked on the basement window, and my sister saw me, she freaked out. I did not realize how messed up I was. Because my best friend and I basically lived over each other's house, I spent the next three days at his house till the swelling went down. When I finally went home, my mother freaked out anyway. And like a good mother, she said, what are you trying to do to me? Still haven't found the answer, but I'll tell you one thing. What that experience did for me was that it gave me a unique eye into the thing that we've been dealing with in America since 1619. It gave me a unique perspective. And when someone's trying to take your life, when you, when you encounter that kind of hatred, when you encounter the kind of intent of hatred and racism that means to rob you of the very thing that you cherish the most, your life, you don't forget what that looks like, you don't forget what that sounds like. You don't forget what that smells like. You don't forget it. You don't, you don't need anyone to tell you when it's happening because it is something that is difficult to communicate verbally, but once you've been there, you know it. And I tell you this tonight because for ever since that night in 1974, I've had reason to be worried, annoyed, irritated about things of race and division and disunity, et cetera, and so on, but I've never felt that feeling of that night until November 2016. And I submit to you, in my humble but totally accurate opinion, <laughs> that as a nation, we need to be concerned. I told folk that African Americans, like coal miners, use a canary sometime to determine whether or not there's methane in the gas mine. If the canary dies, the rest of everybody else better watch out. We have been, we have been the canary in America's coal mine. And what happens to this group, stand by everybody. It doesn't mean you should be resting. You need to be concerned. So that's why I say, while people were sleeping, while folk were sleeping, one of the things that happened while black people slept was that Mr. Ald kept working his plan. Mr. Ald was the name of the man that owned Frederick Douglass at one point when he was a slave. Frederick Douglass, who did not know his birthday because his mother was raped by a slave owner. If you look up Frederick Douglass, he can't tell you when he was born. He just says, died. Born, then died in a certain year. But when he was a child, Frederick Douglass writes in his narrative that he published. Now, he was born also in Maryland on the Eastern Shore, this being the Eastern Shore of Maryland. He was a contemporary of somebody else born on the Eastern Shore, Harriet Tubman. She also was born on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. She was an abolitionist, underground railroad conductor, soldier, spy, and just all around amazing woman. But in 1845, Frederick Douglass, in his narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, recounted an incident when he was a child. And he said that very soon after I went to live with Mr. and Mrs. Auld, she very kindly commenced to teach me the ABC. After I had learned this, she assisted me in learning to spell words of three or four letters. Just at this point of my progress, Mr. Auld found out what was going on and at once forbade Mrs. Auld to instruct me further, telling her, among other things, that it was unlawful as well as unsafe to teach a slave to read. Okay, it's unlawful. It's an unjust law. It's a stupid law. It's an immoral law. It's a bad law, but it's the law. Which makes it even more puzzling about what happened next. Frederick Douglass then went on to write, to use his own words, Mr. Auld, further, he said, if you give, and I have gone through the trouble of taking out the N-word of this to make this more palatable, if you give him an inch, he will take an L. A slave should know nothing but to obey his master, to do as he is told to do. Learning will spoil the best slave in the world. Now, said he, if you teach that boy, speaking of myself, how to read, there would be no keeping him. 
it will forever unfit him to be a slave. He would at once become unmanageable and of no value to his master. As to himself, it could do him no good, but a great deal of harm. So here's Frederick Douglass, a child, black, and property. Let's keep exploring this. It would make him discontented and unhappy. Frederick Douglass then said, these words sank deep into my heart and stirred up sentiments within that lay slumbering and called into existence an entirely new train of thought. It was a new and special revelation explaining dark and mysterious things with which my youthful understanding had struggled, but struggled in vain. I now understood what had been to me a most perplexing difficulty, to wit, the white man's power to enslave the black man. It was a grand achievement and I prized it highly. From that moment, I understood the pathway from slavery to freedom. We don't want to overlook what just happened in Frederick Douglass's life. He is a kid who's black in the 19th century, and he's a slave. He's property. And while his body is yet in bondage, he's figured out as a child that the pathway to his getting that body free, his physical existence begins first with the liberation of his mind. And he also noted that the liberation of his mind caused his slave master a great deal of concern. Consider the levels of authority that Frederick Douglass has to go through. He's a child. He's black. He's property in America in the 19th century. The law says it's against the law to teach him how to read. Mr. Ald is an adult. First off, that's one level of authority. Two, he's male. There's a, it's a patriarchal society. That's the third, second level of authority. Third, he's white. That's another level of authority. Second, he's an owner. That's, a, that four, that's a le another level. Of, four levels of authority, and he is shaken to his roots by the fact that this child may learn to read. Oh, that's serious. And Mr. All said it correctly. I commend him for his honesty. He said, if he learns how to read, you will never be able to keep him as a slave. There's a correlation between intellectual darkness and slavery. And the slave masters say what you want about them, call them many things, but never call them stupid. They figured that part out. People who learn how to read begin asking questions. They begin asking questions about themselves, their lives, their conditions, the things around them. You cannot keep people who are, who are intellectually developed and educated. <coughs> Frederick Douglass fi figured that out. And a couple years after Frederick Douglass' revelation, in 1847, this man, John Brown, stood up in a church in Hudsonville, Ohio, in Hudson, Ohio. And he said, I pledge myself with God's help that I will devote my life to increasing hostility towards slavery. He staged a raid on Harper's Ferry on October 16, 1859. His plan was to raid the federal arsenal, distribute weapons into, weapons into the hills, and begin a guerrilla war that would last for as long as it needed to last to finally break the spine of slavery. John Brown failed at just about everything in his life, including the Harper's Ferry raid. But he did finally bring enough focus and attention to the issue of slavery that pushed the country to a point where at some point something had to finally be done about that evil institution. On December 2nd, 1859, after he'd been captured and tried in Charlestown, 12 miles from Harper's Ferry, he was led to the gallows. He wrote a note before he went and he said, I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land shall never be purged away but with blood. And then came civil war. Abraham Lincoln's election in November 1860 was the catalyst. South Carolina seceded from the Union in December 1860. By January, February 1861, the Confederate States of America were already forming. By March 1861, Alexander A. Stevens gave a speech where he basically said, our new government, the first in the history of the world, is based upon the great truth that the Negro is inferior to the white man, that that is his natural, normal, moral condition. The following month, April 12, 1861, artillery opened up on Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor, and the war was on. 
It took a tremendous amount of American life. Statisticians, people who have done the counts, have figured out, still say that the number of lives lost from 1861 to 1865 still exceeds the combined loss of life from every other conflict we've had in our history. The American Revolution, the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, the Seminole Wars, the Black Hawk Wars, the Spanish-American War, the Philippine Insurrection, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Lebanon, Gulf War I, Gulf War II, Afghanistan, even up to right now. More American life than those four, four years. My God, what were they fighting about? What got Americans so upset, so angry, that they were willing to expend that much energy and lose that much life over a conflict? The war ends on April 9, 1865. The period of Reconstruction begins, trying to rebuild the country literally and reunite the country emotionally. Black people newly freed understand that they are free, and they are not going back into slavery. Of course there was hostility, of course there was tension. And Southerners didn't lose any time at all by projecting what they thought was the predominant and what, well, what was the prevailing narrative. As this illustration right here so aptly shows, the Freedmen's Bureau, which was passed, in 18, which was passed immediately after the 1865, 1866, the Freedmen's Bureau was designed to help slaves, black people who had been enslaved, transition from slavery to freedom. Those who had been refugees, to give them some type of a, a, a assistance in adjusting to a peacetime environment. But as this illustration shows, and I will submit to you, many people have the same kind of narrative running through their minds today. You have this guy right here, a former slave, who's just laying around doing nothing, as the poor people over here are working supporting this guy who's just living off the largesse of the land. If you're living in a post-war environment in the South, and you woke up on April 10, 1865, and you're a Southerner, this kind of image leaves you understandably upset. By 1898, these kind of images were being projected and spread around. The idea of black people in charge, black rule, black politicians, judges, magistrates, postmasters, Councilman, etc. One of the things that the Freedmen's Bureau did was establish something called Freedmen's Schools. Coming out of slavery, black people wanted to do three things more than anything. They wanted to learn to read and write. They wanted to find their relatives who had been sold hither and yon, and they wanted their marriages legalized. Those are three fundamentally human things. What do you want? I want to find my relatives. I want my marriage legalized because the marriage bed was violated repeatedly by you guys in that 246 years. And I want to learn the ABC. They understood that those three things were critical to what was going to happen later on during Reconstruction. A major figure who rose during the Reconstruction period and into the early 20th century was Booker T. Washington who himself was born into slavery in 1856 in the area of Roanoke, Virginia. He eventually ended up going to Hampton Institute, what, what was Hampton, what today is Hampton Institute, Institute. He established Tuskegee, Institu Tuskegee Institute in Tuskegee, Alabama. His whole idea was America is what it is. And since America is what it is, we cannot expect to get civil rights right now. What we must do is fend for ourselves. We must get skills that shows the American nation that we are worthy of full citizenship. People like W.B. Du Bois disagree with that viewpoint, but Dr. Dr. Washington went on ahead and taught people trades and skills. In 1895, at the Cotton Stakes Exposition, he gave what was known as his Atlanta Compromise speech. And in that speech he said, the opportunity to earn a dollar in a factory just now is worth infinitely more they have the opportunity to spend a dollar in an opera house. We don't need to go to an opera house. We need, we need to build houses and homes and businesses. That's what we need to do for ourselves. And he went on to say, in all things that are purely social, we can be as separate as the fingers, yet one is the hand in all things essential to mutual progress. 
Dr. Washington was saying what he needed to say because in 1895, anybody that he's asking money from, especially if they're in the South, they don't want to hear about we can all go to the same movie theater or we can all go to the same dinner club. He wants somebody, they want somebody that's going to validate, we can do this, but we'll do it, you do it over there and I'll do it over here. That's what the Separate Fingers is about. This statue right here is showing him lifting the veil of ignorance. But while all this going on, Southerners, as the dust was settling and the smoke was clearing from the Civil War, Southerners lost no time, I mean no time at all, passing a series of laws called pig laws. These pig laws, which evolved into what were called black codes, basically were laws that guaranteed the criminalization of black life. For example, they passed laws against vagrancy, such as all Southern black codes relied on vagrancy laws to pressure freedmen to sign labor contracts. For example, South Carolina's labor code, code did not limit these laws to unemployed persons, but included others such as peddlers and gamblers. The code provided that vagrants could be arrested in prison at hard labor. But the county sheriff could hire out black vagrants to a white employer to work off their punishment. The courts customarily waited weigh such punishment for white vagrants, allowing them to take an oath of poverty instead. So basically, in a, in a South that is guaranteed to not give people jobs, if you stand around, there are some communities that pass laws against being unemployed. So if you're arrested for not being unemployed, you can be thrown in jail for six months. Maybe something magically happens where you get in trouble inside the jail. They extend that sentence to a year and a half or two years. If that begins to happen enough, and people are incarcerated, which means that they cannot just lay around and do nothing. They are being forced to work against their will, and they're not being paid for it. People being forced to work against their will who are not being paid for it, what is that called? And just in case people needed some help, just in case people wanted to push back a little bit, just in case people wanted to speak out and dissent or fight back, there was, and let me say this very clearly, there was a terrorist organization called the Ku Klux Klan, founded in Pulaski, Tennessee in 1866. Originally, it started out as a gentleman's club, but it very quickly found its calling in terrorizing, intimidating, bullying, murder, and everything else that has some, some type of pejorative activity to make sure people stayed in line. Because slavery always was about controlling people's movements and activity. And Southerners could not have slavery in, in name, but they did everything they could to make sure that they would have it in fact. So there were scenes such as this one, home invasion of the home with violence, intimidation at the polls, and at some point, just outright denial of the vote. By the time you get to the 20th century, tyranny had triumphed. On May 17, 1954, in an environment that we had, that history calls Jim Crow segregation, the Supreme Court passed or decided upon a ruling in the case of Brown versus Board of Education, where they declared that denying black children equal access to education was in violation of the 14th Amendment that was passed in 1866. So a Reconstruction Amendment, one part of which pertained to equal protections under the laws, that to deny black kids access to public education that their parents, by the way, were paying taxes for as well, was unconstitutional because it denied them equal protection under the law. Then the court said, we're going to strike down desegregation, and we want you to end this system with all deliberate speed. All deliberate speed, what exactly does that mean? One year, three years, 300 years? So we, not, we should not be surprised that by 1957, 1964, into the 1970s, there were still school systems around the country that were fighting to implement this. School segregation outlawed by this, as you, as you can see, required in the black area, permitted in these shaded areas, <laughs> And people had been fighting for education. Mr. Ald and his descendants were still very much at work trying to make sure that 
Young people like Frederick Douglass stayed intellectually dark and therefore materially and physically enslaved. They did not leave one stone unturned in their opposition to getting those schools to open up. And in this case, this person even gra grabbed some ideology, socialist agents who infiltrated the Roman Catholic hierarchy are using excommunication to intimidate and force Negroes on our white children. That's, what they got. That's got so many lines of theology and philosophy, I just get confused. <laughs> but then there came this group of people called the Little Rock Nine, 1957. Little Rock Central High School. If you haven't been there, I recommend the trip. Little Rock Central is still standing there. It's a museum site now, and the, the gas station across the street, I mean, it's there, just as it was in 1957. But look at the crowd of people outside this high school. And then look at these guard, the, these, these, these military folk, folk who are standing outside the school. And then having to escort these children into school. And then, in the case of Elizabeth Eckford here, and Hazel Bryan here. The first time I saw this picture, it reminded me of that night in 1974 because the hatred on Hazel Bryan's face, that isn't fake. That's not made up. That's palpable. Look at her rage. Look at Elizabeth Egbert. Imagine she's not, this is not, a, she, this is a young woman, this is a child. She's in 11th grade, and what's she trying to do that particular morning? She's trying to get to school. She's walking in a mob of people that want to rip her apart. I can't even begin to imagine how she must be trembling on the inside. She needs the help of the United States military to get to school. The stress on her is apparent at this point. Fortunately, there are people like Ms. Grace Larsh who will come, come forth to comfort Elizabeth Egbert. It turned out that in 1957, Mr. All's descendants were still very busy on making sure that those folk would not learn how to learn the ABC. And when I say asleep, there are people today, there are systems today, there are thought processes today, there is legislation today, there are folk today who are saying you don't need an education, you don't need a college education. And I told my sons at least, when people are telling you you don't need to go to school, what I want to know is ask them are they telling their kids that? Because if they're not telling their kids that, then I would suspect the advice they're giving you. In a day and time when we know that technology is becoming more, not less prevalent. In a day and time where to have an education is the key between success or failure. In a day or time when education means being able to look beyond the Earth's boundaries. It's the difference, it's the difference in how much you're going to make over the course of a lifetime. And I had to debate whether or not to hit you with a bunch of facts and statistics. You've already gotten all that. The general statement here is that we need to get busy and look at what Mr. Ald has been doing and find out what, what can we do to make sure that education is available to not just black kids, but all kids. This is a matter for the United States. While folk were sleeping, justice declared it was working for just us. You see, after the Civil War, the 13th Amendment was passed. The 13th Amendment said, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States or any place subject to the jurisdiction, except as a punishment, crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. So you cannot be enslaved and held against your will, unless you have been convicted duly of a crime. That process I told you all about, where the vagrancy laws, you criminalize people's lives, you get you arrested for being unemployed, for standing around on a street corner, 
you put them in jail. You get enough of them in jail, and then you can go ahead and put them to work, and then not be paid. You can, in the case of Western North Carolina, you can put them to work working on a railroad so that the private railway company gets the work done by state prison labor that is either free or cheap. And this goes on throughout the South. If you're interested, if you're taking notes, there is a, there's a book, actually it's a DVD called Slavery by Another Name. Slavery by Another Name. You can get it on YouTube. The whole thing has been posted on YouTube. And it explains this in greater detail how you get these chain gangs. And, and then this also, there's something else that begins to happen is that America, as America sees more and more black faces in its, in its incarceration, this penal system, the association has made that a lot of prisoners appear to have brown faces. Is it, like, is it because brown people are more inclined to commit crime? Or could it be that there are laws that are guaranteed to make you arrested, to guarantee you get put in here? And on it goes through Georgia. Justice said it's working for just us. And the interesting thing about justice saying it works for just us, I told my students that the, the, the thing to focus upon in this picture is not Abe Smith and Tommy Ship hanging from the tree. The thing to focus upon in this picture are the folk who are looking dead into the eye of the camera. It is August 7th, 1930 in Marion, Marion, Indiana. Not Memphis, Tennessee, not Biloxi, Mississippi, not Birmingham, Alabama. Marion, Indiana, an alleged northern state. And the people standing beneath two dead bodies, by the way, hanging on a tree outside the courthouse, is no longer there. But the folk in this particular picture, they're young and they're old. They're male, they're female. Every last one of them is looking to the eye of the camera, and they are absolutely sure that whoever sees this is not going to come and ask them, were you there? Do you know they're not going to be prosecuted? They're, no, they're in no threat of being incarcerated. They're in no threat of being shamed. They're in no threat of being jailed. And here's the question that I want to know. I want to know, how do they know that? How do they know that they can literally commit murder, look at the eye of the camera, and get away with it? What is it about their laws, their customs, their society, everything that tells them they can do this and not have to worry about it and go home and sleep well that night and go on to church the following Sunday and praise the Lord? How do they know that? How do they get communicated? Who told them that? That that was possible? This is from, this is a postcard. And if you're reading it, it says, this is the barbecue we had last night. My picture is to the right, left, with a cross over it, your son Joe. This is from a book entitled Without Sanctuary. I'll show you all in just a minute. But Without Sanctuary is, is, Without Sanctuary is, a, is basically nothing but a book of all these pictures. Imagine, I told my students at Hope, you know, if, if you have a postal worker working at a post office today and a packet falls open and there's a bunch of child pornography pictures that fall out, that postal worker is going to take that packet, take it to a supervisor, they're going to track down where that thing came from, and whoever sent it is going to be arrested because we do, not, we do not agree that that's not something we want in our society. But once upon a time, it was possible to send a lynching postcard through the mail and people would just see it and send it on to its destination. <coughs> Enter James Cameron. There's supposed to have been a third person hanging from that tree that night. His name was James Cameron. That's him right there. James Cameron was friends with Abe Smith and Tommy Ship. Abe Smith and Tommy Ship had tried to get him involved in going out and getting a little bit rambunctious and doing what teenagers do, or that's what they thought they were supposed to do. They ended up robbing a couple, and James Cameron saw that the young couple that they were robbing, the guy was a friend of his, and he said, you know what, I don't want nothing to do with you guys. But in, they ended up, somebody ended up getting shot. Claude Dieter ended up getting shot. And James Cameron escaped that lynching that night. 
They had him in jail. He tells the story that they had him in jail. They were saying, we want Cameron. We want Cameron. We want Cameron. And James Cameron tells a story. According to him, he said they took him out there. They put a rope around his neck. And then a hush fell over the crowd. And he says he heard someone say he didn't have nothing to do with that. Let that boy go. And the crowd backed away and let him go away. He went on to move from Marion, Indiana to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where he had a family. He got a job as an engineer. But the experience, this experience of that night never left him. And into his 80s and into his 90s, he did not stop agitating to bring attention to what he called the Black Holocaust. In 2005, the United States Senate finally got around to apologizing for lynching. In 2005, also known as 13 years ago. So what about 2018? In 2018, one area where justice, I think, is being compromised is in the area of private prisons. I mean, think about it. I have tried to wrap my mind around this. How can you possibly have justice in a justice system where the incentive is to put people behind bars for profit? The cause is to put people in jail, not keep them out if it's to be profited. And this has become extremely profitable, particularly when it comes to questions of, can there be justice? Can there be breaches of justice? Of course there can be breaches of justice. From the very beginning, there was a breach of justice aspirationally because when the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, as the ink of those words was drying on the parchment. There's already a, sl a slave system that was not being started, but actively thriving, growing, and profiting when those words were written. So it is possible to have two different things that are cognitively dissonant, actively. So how can you have justice when you have a system of private prisons, particularly these days targeting people from Central and South America and other immigrants, particularly those parts of the world, those parts of the world that have been loosely referred to as blank hole countries. How can you have it? Where is justice? We know that justice, I, I, when, after, the, after the election, I remember hearing a news commentator saying, well, it may be troubling, but we have to have faith in, in the institution. The institutions will hold. The center will hold. And I remembered this photo from August 1930. The institutions were there, too, and justice still, injustice still occurred. This is a Supreme Court, education, religion, government. We had all the institutions, but this still happened. Where were the institutions then? We've been asleep, and while we were sleeping, the men of the 54th Massachusetts were spinning in their graves. The 54th Massachusetts Regiment was a, what they call a colored or all black regiment of the Civil War. On July 18, 1863, in an assault on Fort Wagner, these combination of ex-slaves and free black men came together in the 54th Massachusetts, and they volunteered to be the tip of the spear of the assault on Fort Wagner. Tactically, this was an insane proposition. To the east, there was water. To the west, there was a swamp. Their line of advance was straight uphill, running in sand in July in South Carolina, in heavy wool uniforms, carrying heavy muskets, with people shooting cannon and musket fire at them. They volunteered to be the tip or the point of the spear of the assault. And it may be out there, I have not yet found it, I have not yet seen it. I just got through telling one of my students just the other day, trying to get him to get himself together. I said, I cannot tell you why they did that, other than there was a great controversy going on at the time about would black men actually fight if given a chance. Now, despite the fact that there were African Americans who fought in the American Revolution, 
in the War of 1812, and in every other conflict up to the Civil War, the question always came around, will they do it? Are they smart enough to do it? Do they have the guts to do it? Are they smart enough? Et cetera, and so on. So it's always going back to the same set of questions to relitigate them. And to prove once and for all that this argument about they won't fight, they don't have enough courage, et cetera, to put that to, vet, to, put that to rest, these men looked at that tactical situation. You're going to make a frontal assault on a fort running uphill in sand in broad daylight with cannon fire and musket fire coming down on you, running uphill, they got the high ground. You don't need to be a military tactician genius to figure out that that is a bad proposition. But they volunteered to do it. And my belief is that they did that on that day because they collectively made the choice. We do this today. We lay down this carpet of blood today in the hope, as an investment, and in the hope that our children's grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren's children's grandchildren, this is our investment in making sure that it'll be better for them. So let us gird ourselves up like men and march into eternity, which is exactly what they did. These black soldiers, by the end of the Civil War, 186,000 black men, or about 20 to 25 percent of the Union Army, will be comprised of these troops. You don't need to motivate them, because from the moment that the firing started on Fort Sumter, black folks knew instantly what was at stake. Lose the Civil War, slavery continues. Win the Civil War, slavery ends. Frederick Douglass was constantly telling Abraham Lincoln, you have got to let us get into this fight because the last thing Frederick Douglass and other people feared was, we cannot have this thing in, slavery be abolished, because they will ever throw it in our face that they gave us our freedom and we did not earn it. So blood is part of the equation that we must, that we must contribute here. And so they began the assault. It was brutal as depicted. If you've seen the movie Glory, there's a great scene with the assault on Fort Wagner. Colonel Robert Gould Shaw, the, command, the, the white officer commanding this, this unit, was killed in combat. They eventually uh, scaled the heights of the fort, but they did not take the fort. When Colonel Shaw's parents in Massachusetts wrote the Confederate High Command asking for his body to return home, the Confederate High Command said, we have buried him with his niggers. Which actually was progress. Because in a country that had gone through the trouble of having segregated cemeteries, which still puzzles me. I mean, they're dead. <laughs> April 9th, the war ends. There are people today, today, right now, as I speak to you, who will tell you that the Civil War was about states' rights, different economic systems, you know, westward movement, and it was about all those things. But most historians have come down and said that by the time you get through looking at all of it, states' rights, industrialism versus agriculture, westward expansion, all those rivers, all those streams flow into the same river, and that common point of commonality, everything that tied all those differences together was a system called chattel slavery. In other words, it was fought over slavery. Americans spent four years having a big argument over basically fundamentally arguing about some people insist upon the right to own and use and dispose of other people as they see fit, and other people, quite frankly, the North didn't really care, but their Republican values of free soil, free labor, free men. This is not what free people in a free republic who, are supposed to, who believe in individual liberty do. This is not how we operate. So the dust settled and the smoke cleared. We started moving toward the 20th century. But by the time you get to the 21st century, some strange things begin to happen in the narrative about the Civil War. For example, on January 23rd, 2012, the Huffington Post reported that Tea Party groups in Tennessee demand textbooks overlook U.S. founder slave holding history. Bear with me as I read. 
A little more than a year after the State Board of Education in Texas approved massive changes to its school textbooks to put slavery in a more positive light, a group of Tea Party activists in Tennessee has renewed its push to whitewash school textbooks. The group is seeking to remove references to slavery and mentions of the country's founders being slave owners. According to reports, there has been an awful lot of made-up criticism about, for instance, the founders intruding on the Indians or having slaves or being hypocrites in one way or another. Did you get that, intruding upon the Indians? <laughs> the thing we need to focus on about what the founders, about the founders is that given the social structure of their time, there were revolutionaries who brought liberty into a world where it hadn't existed to everybody. Not all equally instantly. And it was their progress that we need to look at. During the news conference, more than two dozen Tea Party activists handed out material that said, neglect and outright ill will have distorted the teaching of the history and character of the, of the United States. We seek to compel the teaching of students in Tennessee, the truth regarding the history of our nation and the nature of its government. And that further teaching would also include that the Constitution created a republic, not a democracy. The group demanded, as they had in January of last year, that Tennessee lawmakers change state laws, governing school curricula, et cetera. Then, David Blight, an American historian, responded by saying, listen, history's job isn't to make people feel happy about themselves or their, or their culture. That's why we have religion, churches, and community organizations. <laughs> That's why we have rabbis and psychologists, not historians. July 5th, 2015, the Washington Post reported, Five million public school students in Texas will begin using new social studies textbooks this fall based on state academic standards that barely address racial segregation. The state's guide, guidelines for teaching American history also do not mention the Ku Klux Klan or Jim Crow laws. Can you see why the 54th Massachusetts might be spinning in their graves? And when it comes to the Civil War, children are supposed to learn that the conflict was caused by sectionalism, states' rights, and slavery, written deliberately in that order to telegraph slavery's secondary role in driving the conflict, according to some members of the State Board of Education. Slavery was a side issue to the Civil War, said a school board member when the board adopted standards in 2010. There would be those who would say that the reason for the Civil War was over, was over slavery. No, it was over states' rights. Then the New York Times ran an article that showed the, the article was, Texas mother teaches textbook company lesson on accuracy, October 5th, 2015. It turned out that her son was in class and saw this particular map in the textbook. And the map said, the Atlantic slave trade between 1500 and 1800s brought millions of workers. <laughs> Are you tracking me? <laughs> Echo of a king. Nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. <laughs> this statement on the left is attributed to Plato. Strange times are these in which we live when old and young are taught falsehoods in school. And the person that dares tell the truth is called at once a lunatic and fool. And then there's what St. Augustine said. The truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. Let it loose. It will defend itself. John Adams, facts are stubborn things. They tend not to want to go away. <laughs> so, just a few areas where people have been asleep. What do we know? What do, you know, what do we know right now today in 2018? April 19, 2018, there are some knowns. We know that black folks, all Americans, need to have opportunity to make money. We know this. The interesting thing about segregation and Jim Crow was that they would tell you, we're not going to hire you, no housing, no opportunity. But it, didn't mean to, it, did, it did not diminish the fact that people needed some place to go to school, some place to work, and some place to live. That was a conundrum of Jim Crow. No, we're not going to, no, we're not going to cooperate, but you still need to do it. In the case of Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921, Black Americans did it so well to where they ended up being called the Black Wall Street, the wealthiest community in the nation. Their not so wealthy white neighbors were jealous of that. And when the moment it came to make sure that they were reduced to their proper level of impoverishment, they were rioted, bombed, and firebombed out of their homes. 
And insurance companies said no, no, no when it came time to collect on insurance policies. So we know that folk need opportunity and the tools of currency to live. We know that people need housing. We know that people will need justice. We know that people are going to still need an education. We know this. We know that people still demand, because we are Americans, to have their own right to choose their, what kind of life, what kind of liberty, what kind of pursuit of happiness. They dictate for themselves because that is the essence of what it means to be an American, to have that choice. We know these things, but we also know the lay of the land. Here's the lay of the land. The lay of the land is that, first of all, the cavalry is not coming. We are not getting any help. I said to my students, I said to my sons, if the cavalry was coming, they would have been here. It's been 1619. I'm con it's been since 1619. I'm convinced they're not coming. Second, we know Congress has no incentive to take meaningful action. When I was campaigning up in Muskegon, when I was campaigning in Muskegon Heights, when I was down at Benton Harbor, when I talked to folks back in Washington, D.C., in my own neighborhood, along the Maryland, D.C. line, the Capitol Heights that was, was economically stressed then, I would ask them sometimes, what, uh, what, what possible reason would people in Congress, in both parties, either parties, have to come and help this neighborhood out? What are they going to gain from it? We know that whoever Congress is working for is probably this guy. We know that snake oil salesmen right now, on April 19th, 2018, the snake oil salesmen rule the day. For whatever reason, people have decided to believe the lie, and therefore the liars. At Hope College, because I can say it at Hope College, you know, we, my students are trying to understand one day, I said, consider this. That on the day that Christ was crucified, there were people out there in that mob calling for his head who didn't have second-hand, third-hand, fourth-hand, but first-hand experience with him. People whom he had talked to, people whom he had helped, people whose bodies he had straightened out, people whose eyes he had given back sight, ears he had given back hearing, people who knew that he was innocent, people that knew that he was who he said he was, people who understood that only way he could do what he said he could do is that they believed that he said who he was. They knew that, and they still cried for his head. That is our conundrum. That is the dilemma of our species. That we can be helped directly and still cry for the head of the master. So we know this. We know that the stick of salesmen are out there. We know that over bigotry is welcome again. You see, in November 2016, I went to Winston Salem, North Carolina, for a wedding. A friend of mine got married down there. On the way back, I stopped at a rest stop and heard, overheard some people talking about the possibility of an election. And the guy says, well, are you surprised that racism is as strong as it is? And I said, friend, I never thought that it went away. What I was finally glad about was that people had enough grace to not mention it openly. But it's back again. It's been welcomed with open arms. And xenophobia is being re-energized. It's fashionable, it's fashionable again to treat the immigrant like dirt, although immigrants have been treated like dirt forever. Once upon a time, they were called Irish Catholics. For example, can you tell me, can you define for me what's going on in this picture? What's happening? You see that? That's right, the papal vestments. So once upon a time, they were called Irish Catholics or Catholics, then it became Italians, then it became Jews, then it became even Germans during World War I. Everybody's had their wave. In World War II, they were called Japanese Americans. Emphasis on the fact, an emphasis on the Americans. In the, the First World War, when the black people started moving from the south to the north, in internal migration, they were called, well, a African Americans. We know these things. We know these things, and I, have, and I have come to understand these things at this moment in this time. I share that story with you because the unique vision that I wondered all these decades, why did that beating happen for me? And in a strange way, God may have given me a vision, a particular vision that lets me see what's going on at a moment like this. 
to do what I can to send out a warning. And the warning is this. We are Americans. We are better than what's been broadcast in the news. We are better than what's happening in Washington. America is an idea. It's a nation, but it's an idea. How much of an idea is it? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> America is this kind of idea. A little kid in Meru, Kenya, the rural area of Kenya, a number of years ago, dust from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He found out from America, he wanted to talk to me. I said, what do you know about America? He recited the entire Declaration of Independence in the Meru province of Kenya. Ideas of freedom and liberty and prosperity are not unique to us, but since we have embodied them, with all of our harassment of immigrants, we still are the model of the world's best, largest, pluralistic democracy. We make democracy work, but we have to want it to work. We have to participate, and democracy is not guaranteed. It is a, it is a blood sport. We must get involved. So the time for sleeping is over with. We need to get active. Thank you for letting me share some of your time.